Okay. The time being seven o'clock on Thursday, February 17th, 2022, I call to order the public meeting of the Rentham School Committee. My name is Veronica Gonzalez and I am the chair of the Rentham School Committee. We are hosting this meeting in person in the Vogel Auditorium of the Delaney Elementary School. Per state mandate, everyone in attendance is required to wear a mask over their nose and mouth. The meeting is being live streamed on the district's YouTube channel and recorded. The recording will be posted on the district's website. The first order of business this evening is public comment. Members of the public may speak to the school committee for up to three minutes on any agenda or non-agenda item related to the responsibilities of the school committee. Members of the school committee will listen to the comments from the public, but typically do not respond during public comment portion of the meeting. People wishing to speak to the school committee should be recognized and then we'll move to the lectern. Please state your name and address before speaking. Would anybody present tonight like to make a public comment? Right here. Thank you, my name is Kevin Mooney. I live at 40 Red Fox Run in Rentham. And uh, my concern is I'm, I'm very happy that you voted to remove the mask mandate. However, I am concerned because we know that inevitably we'll, we're gonna see another strain of this virus. So I kind of wanna know how the school, school committee was thinking um, when they voted to mask, voluntarily vote to re mask preschoolers. Um, I wanna know what information the Board of Health had that the school committee did not have uh, it seems to me that back in December, it was common knowledge that children had a reduced rate of transmission of this disease. They um, had greater resilience to the disease and that they have an absolutely astronomical survival rate of this disease, much more so than even the common flu, which we do not mask children for. So given that all this information was common, it appears that preschoolers were put at psychological harm and a physical discomfort um, for for what reason? Was it possibly to reduce the, um, the stress level or maybe the anxiety of the staff or the, or the administration or any of the adults in the school? Um, I can't think of another logical explanation. So I, I find that disturbing. Um, I think, uh, I, well, my other questions are, um, I would like to know what, since the kids were forced to, uh, to mask up, I'd like to know what happened in the school. Were teachers reminded to lead by example and not nag children who find it difficult to breathe and or keep an uncomfortable mask on their face? I work in public schools myself and I saw a lot of nagging going on. I don't work in Rentham, but I've worked in dozens of schools over the past 20 years. And I kind of have a good feel for the, um, you know, the environment of public schools in the, in the state. Uh, were students also, were they explained, at least for the older children, were they explained the pros and cons of masks? Were they told why these adults took this unprecedented course of action to forcibly mask their face and impair their breathing? Were their questions answered or were they discouraged? Uh, I know many anecdotal um, stories, at least myself, from my, my niece, who, uh, who told that you know, children on the bus were told to shut up or, or to keep their, keep their opinions to themselves when they were told that they didn't like wearing a mask. I think it's, this, this didn't happen in Rhythm, but I think it's kind of common for kids to rebel a little bit. And um, at the very least, if we're gonna impair their breathing, they should know the pros and the cons. They should be educated as to what is happening. They shouldn't be indoctrinated and brainwashed into thinking that you can just have somebody force a child to impair their breathing and cover up their respiratory system. So with that said, I'm done, thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else like to make a public comment this evening? Okay, thank you very much. We're gonna move on to our next item of business and it is to approve our meeting minutes from um, January 19th. If I make, could. Make a motion to thank you. the minutes. Second. Thank you, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? And then any abstention? Thank you. I should also, also just mention Eric Greenberg is not in attendance tonight. Okay, moving on to old business. We um, this evening have to do our school committee self-evaluation. So this is an annual review that we do of ourselves, the five of us. The purpose is to identify what our committee does well and identify any areas of improvement that we might need to focus on. Um, it is anonymous. We all submit it. I receive the results. 
um, and then I just matriculated everything to share with, with you tonight. So we judged ourselves um, based on several different categories, governance, operations, member relations, committee and superintendent relations, strategic planning and fiscal management, community relations, and the conduct of our meetings. So I just wrote a little snippet about each one once I matriculated all the information from everybody. So under the category of governance, uh, we are all in agreement that our policies are clear and current. We effectively supervise Dr. Cameron and we work with him to set goals and objectives for the district. Under the category of operations, we agree that we're well trained upon appointed to the school committee and we're well equipped with proper materials and training. And we also all agree that we're able to uh, communicate with Dr. Cameron openly and are comfortable asking questions for clarification or seek information when necessary. One area that was identified to work on is better identifying our specific roles as officers to the public. That was something that came up. I actually should have paused and asked if you guys want to say anything, any comment, any feedback. It's open for conversation amongst us, so we can do that. So that was just, that was one little piece that, that stood out is that maybe we somehow can uh, share what our each role, what our roles are independently, like the PTO and the West, um, assistant chair, you know, et cetera. Okay. Um, let's see, under the category of member relations, our strength that shined through is our respect for each other, which I thought was wonderful given the times and what we've been through the last several months or really two years, that um, at the end of the day, we all still have respect for each other, which is really great. Um, we're fairly comfortable in voicing our opinions as proven when we deliberate on tough votes that we've had to do a few times now. When we do vote, we're able to accept the will of the majority, but we might need to work on supporting these decisions once they're made whether they go in our favor or they don't. Any comments? Food for thought, okay. <laughs> um, under the category of school committee and superintendent relations, we proved to be openly communicative with Dr. Cameron and there's really a mutual respect between the committee and the superintendent, which is wonderful. You don't see that in every town. We work well together, so kudos to all of us. Um, under the category of community relations, we find ourselves accessible to the public regarding school issues. We've proven to be very responsive to communications. We've received numerous emails over the last few weeks and months, and we're very responsive to those, which is great. One area we may need to visit is our ability to encourage feedback from community members. Um, so this might be something we wanna discuss. So it's, I, th I think it was in regards to open comment uh, as we just had. So during our monthly meetings, we have open comment, but it's not a back forth conversation, but we are able to have those back forth conversations via email um, and even phone calls that we have had with members of the community too. So if, if the open comment isn't meant to be a dialogue, um, that maybe it's something that we revisit in what portion of our meeting we have that moment at or, or something. An open dialogue amongst ourselves or with the audience? I don't know. I'm trying to, I was trying to interpret it as well. So my understanding is that during these types of meetings, we, it's a meeting in public amongst ourselves, not us having a meeting with the public. So right. I don't believe that there's any moment where we are, unless we choose to, there's no moment that we're actually supposed to interact with the public. Okay. That's my understanding. Yep. So one um, recommendation that I've gotten from the community is that um, I believe that uh, the board of the Board of Selectmen um, has a comment period for each item of new business. So rather than having one time for public comment, you would say something like, um, okay, for new business, we have donation for full day kindergarten tuition assistance. Would anyone in the, in the attendance like to make a comment about this issue? Right. Then we would discuss it, then we would vote. Mm -hmm. um, then the next order of new business is, I believe that's the way the select board does it. Um, uh, at least we could ask. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> we have one person. I believe that's the way the select board does it, correct? Okay. 
Okay. Can I ask a question? Absolutely. Also? Is there ever the feeling as if maybe an audience member has a comment that they want to make, but they have to wait until the end of the meeting because that's the last item on the agenda. Maybe they would like to make their comment. I'm a little bit surprised that the audience would prefer to have to wait until the end of the meeting to be able to make a comment uh, than having the opportunity to say it right away because we've often seen audience members making their comments and then leaving. I'm, yeah, I personally would not see a problem with that at all. I would just feel a little bit bad for the audience that has to really stay until their item is discussed. Well, right. if it's on the agenda, they can talk about it. You would have a comment period for each agenda item. And then if it's, I think is what you're saying. So, so if you have two agenda items, you would have a comment period for each of those. Mm -hmm. And then you'd have a comment period at the end for anything not covered on the agenda. Or if there was a comment left over that you didn't discuss. Okay. So in the past, what we've done... Um, I think it was last year, we had all public comment at the end of the meeting, and that was not well received. No, I like the way we do it now. Yeah. I Personally, I do too. Um, it was, you know, and I, and I understood the feelings of community members who came to our meetings, and then we would vote, and then they, they wanted to say something, and we had already voted, so it was sort of a moot point. Yeah. So I do like that we have switched it to the beginning, um, but I would be open to that suggestion too. It's not something we need to vote on yeah, no, or no. anything, but it's good to have the conversation Definitely not about something it. I'm against at all. Okay. So we can visit that. Sure. All right. Anything further on that, on that um, section? Okay. So the last uh, category is the conduct of our meetings, and this is where we scored our highest. We are all in agreement that we are well prepared for our meetings. Uh, they are well organized. It's smooth. Um, and we offer plenty of opportunity for discussion amongst ourselves. And that's really thanks to you, Veronica, the way that you handle the meetings thank you. and the way that you've responded to the public being our voice, and I want to thank you for that. Thank you. Um, so that's it. That is the, that is the school committee self-evaluation. Um, so moving on to new business, and that is that we need to accept a donation um, I don't know, maybe Phil wants to speak to that first, or Alan, would you prefer to? I'm, I'm happy to do whatever, whatever you two prefer. Well, we, we, have a, we, we need to make a vote to accept a donation um, for full day kindergarten tuition um, assistance. So do you want to, maybe you can sure. have a few words. Um, so obviously, uh, full day kindergarten in Rentham is something that um, parents still pay tuition for. Um, we're one of uh, about 10% of the towns. We're going to talk about this, I think, a little bit in the budget. Or well, yeah. I mean, I could talk. I could talk about the background whenever, whenever you're, whenever it, it fits. So um, I don't know what the what the amount is of the donation. So, so that's. Um, yep. So right. So I, I can get the exact. I'll pull up the exact number right now. Um, well, I can lay the groundwork then. Why don't you lay the, the groundwork? Okay. Sounds good. So. Um, so we, as, as Phil had mentioned, we're one of the, the few districts in Massachusetts that still charge tuition for a full day kindergarten. And that's a long background for why we even have tuition for full day kindergarten in Massachusetts and why Rentham is still charging. It's a, it was an, it's a, it's a legacy aspect of how kindergarten was taught in Massachusetts. Um, you probably remember back, if you're from Massachusetts, back when you were in kindergarten, you probably had an AM program and a PM program, and it was half day, maybe you switched halfway through the year. That's largely because 
the state doesn't have the same number of required instructional hours for kindergarten that it has for first grade through fifth grade, sixth grade through eighth grade, ninth grade and up. So because of that, the school districts are allowed to have the students in kindergarten in for half the time, half the day. What they started to realize in the 90s is that students really benefited from a full day experience. But you're gonna make your half day staff members full day staff members, or if you're going to double your staff to support full day learning for all those students, you need more money. And not a lot of towns have a lot of ready cash available to give to the schools to make that happen. So schools started charging tuition for students who stayed for the extended period of time. And it started off with just that, with most students still needed half day, and then some students would stay for the remainder of the day. But as the research came out about the benefits for students, particularly students with learning disabilities, about the benefits of being in school for that additional time, more and more uh, districts started to, to adopt it. Back in the early 2000s, the state offered a kindergarten grant to help school districts transition to full day kindergarten. Uh, Rentham did not take part in that grant, and I don't know why, that's before I was here. Um, when I arrived in 2014, uh, the grant was on its last legs, and I we took action right away to start applying, trying to hit the, the benchmarks you need to do to in order to receive the grant. Um, we applied for NAEYC accreditation, which is an aspect of getting the grant, put those things in place, um, but the grant didn't come through from the state. Uh, so that state money is not available, uh, leaving us still having to charge tuition to pay the salaries of the people who work with the students during that time. Now, over the years, really since 2015-16, uh, we've been reducing kindergarten tuition because we know it's a priority. It was a big priority for the former school committee chair, Tracy Murphy, and it's continued to be a priority for the school committee since. Um, the way we are able to reduce it is when we have any kind of either we have to either use an increase in the budget that we get from the town, or if we have any savings we realize through a retirement, we can take a salary position and move it from the revolving account, the tuition revolving account that we use to pay those staff members into the operating budget, which is what we're gonna review tonight, which is part of our, the money we get from the town. The more people we can move from the revolving account into the operating budget, the lower tuition gets to the point where we have no tuition at all. And I'm very proud we've reduced tuition from $325 a month in 2015-16 to $270 a month uh, this year. And we are targeting 2025 as our year for no more kindergarten tuition. We've had other priorities staffing-wise in the district, which is why we've had to hold off a little bit on moving aggressively on kindergarten. We had to increase mental health staffing, special ed staffing, curriculum support positions, increase uh, some of our specials. We had a lot of things we had to fund that were a higher priority than kindergarten tuition. But this is a top priority now, and so we're able to pursue it pretty aggressively. We also, relatively recently, 2015-16, started offering assistance for full day kindergarten. Uh, we didn't have that before. We put that in place based on uh, income. People who make a certain amount can get a, a reduced kindergarten tuition. Most families, almost all, were able to work with them to help them to stay in full day kindergarten if their kids want to be. And almost all of them do. I think we have, what, four kids in half day now? Three kids. Actually, it's funny too because they leave half day on a regular school bus. So it's like a huge yellow limo with three students driving by my house on the way out every day that day. Um, but anyway, we don't want to refuse anybody who wants to pay a full day K because of a financial issue. However, if they can't, if the income sliding scale support doesn't work, if they still need more assistance, we don't have money available to offset it. And so families are stuck having to choose between either trying to find the money or shifting to half day kindergarten. And that's why this donation will be very beneficial for us because we can earmark it for kindergarten assistance 
And then those families who need additional support beyond the sliding scale financial assistance we provide, we'll be able to support them. I'm so, sorry I put you all towards you to tear for that long. Back um, away, <laughs> that's the gist. So I, I think just a couple of other notes for this, right? I think that we, uh, as a committee, have been talking about this um, over a number of meetings. Um, and it's, I think, a, a high priority for the committee to um, to eliminate, to even accelerate even faster the elimination of this. Um, I noticed that the, uh, the town of Weymouth received a grant through COVID-19 funds from the state that was uh, uh, secured by their uh, state uh, rep and state senator to eliminate that um, in one fell swoop, um, which would be terrific. So I think part of what we really want to do is identify uh, those kinds of opportunities. So in terms of outreach to uh, our local uh, and state elected officials, um, addressing grants, and then in the meantime, I think doing what we can to hopefully put some operationalization around this fundraising effort to help families that are not able to meet the sliding scale um, requirement. So um, the total amount of the, uh, of the donation will be $1,650. Um, and that was done sort of very quickly because we're near um, nearing the end of the school year, believe it or not, in terms of those tuition payments. Uh, and so we wanted to make sure that all the kids who are in full day can, can stay there. Um, and then, uh, and then, you know, I think the idea would be that through a, through fundraising, um, I know I've spoken with Aaron about PTO and other sort of opportunities to do some fundraising. We've talked about West. So there's a lot of community organizations in town that can sort of help with, with this but so that we can both accelerate the uh, larger sources of funding to reduce the rates faster for everybody, eliminate the tuition faster for everybody, and then have an additional uh, support system so that we can provide more assistance uh, to more families who um, uh, have less financial security. So that's it. What was the amount again, Phil? I'm sorry. 1650 Thank you. Do either of you have um, any questions or comments? No, I just want to say thank you, though, because when this issue came up between Alan and Phil, you guys jumped on it and got the ball rolling and raised that money over, what, a couple days? That was amazing. Thank you. So I'd like to go ahead and make a motion to accept the donation for full day kindergarten tuition for $1,650. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And any abstentions? Great. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. Thank you all. The next item on our agenda is school choice vote. Yes, every year. So school choice <laughs> is a program Massachusetts has where students in districts may move from one district, their home district, to another district through the school choice program. They have to choose a district that participates in school choice. And a portion of their um, the, the money that they would normally go to their town district will go to the receiving district. Um, every year, every school committee has to vote on whether or not to participate in school choice. Uh, we have, remember, there's not been a school choice district, uh, largely because of the potential impact on class size. So I would, again, recommend that you vote uh, not to participate in school choice because of the potential impact on class size. I do remember this from last year. You do too. I'll make a motion uh, to not participate in school choice in 2022-2023. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And any abstention? Great. Thank you. Alan, just out of curiosity, do you know any neighboring towns that do participate? No. Okay. It's, it's, it's because of the the districts around here, most of the, it's not very popular around here, but in mm. central and, and western Massachusetts, it's more common because you might go to a district that has a program that your child is really interested in that the home district wouldn't have. Right. Um, because of the, the few students in the district mm -hmm. around here. Every town has a, yeah. What they, what they're looking for. Interesting. Thank you. 
Um, okay, so we move to the superintendent's report to the committee, and it starts with the uh, COVID response update, which yes. we started last night. Yes, we didn't yes. quite get to finish. So, uh, based on your vote last night to lift the mask mandate effective today for students four and under, and effective for everybody five and up on the 28th, I wanted to take you through some of the operational changes that are going to happen resulting from that vote and just update you on, on some of that. So first I sent out notice to the community last night so that everyone knows about the change in the mask mandate. And I will send out an additional update tomorrow because we're still going through some of the process of unpacking what life is going to be like without masks on. And I'll have, I think I'll have all things in a place for this for uh, by tomorrow afternoon. So, but broadly speaking, um, mask will be optional for everyone on the, starting on the 28th, as I mentioned, uh, preschool students under five starting today, um, with a few caveats. Uh, caveats would be on the school bus because that's a federal mandate, so they have to wear masks on the school bus. Uh, in the nurse's office, they've got to wear masks in there, the health office, excuse me. Um, and then the state encourages people to wear masks if you are not vaccinated. That's a recommendation, not a mandate. So we will recommend people do that, but we're not going to be mandating that. And the state also, one of their protocols has people who have COVID and are in isolation for five days and are no longer symptomatic, they may return to school on the sixth day after five days of isolation but they're supposed to wear a mask on the, for five days after they come back for that 10 day window. Um, what we're going to do for that is the nurses are going to tell staff members and families that that's what the expectation is um, and, and Kurt, uh, expect that they will follow that. Uh, but they're not going to be telling teachers or anyone else because that's confidential health information. So they're not gonna be sharing that, but we will be putting out there that's what the the protocol from the state is um, for people to do. Um, anybody may wear a mask. They may not wear a mask. One of the messages that I highlighted today for the teachers was the importance of talking with the students about that. It's an individual and a family choice around who wears masks. Somebody may wear a mask one day and somebody may not wear a mask on one day and that's okay. And what we need to do is not tease or question anybody for their mask choice because that is what what they and their family have decided for them to do. Mm -hmm. And based on how things went last year when the masks were optional, we had no problems. Everybody adjusted very smoothly and we had some students and teachers with masks on and some without masks <coughs> and there really wasn't much of a, of a problem. So I anticipate it being Another smooth transition. I hope so, yes. Yep. There, is, there is more heightened parental emotion now on both sides than there was last year, but I think that the students will probably be able to roll with it just like they did last year. Um, the teachers and the principals are going to work with the students to help them understand that. And you know, and I'll be modeling that myself. Some days I'll be wearing a mask, some days I'm not going to be wearing a mask because I want everybody to feel comfortable doing what, what they want to do. That's one of the most important parts of being in school is feeling respected and comfortable for your choice. Uh, let's see here. We are allowing visitors back in the building effective the 28th. Uh, visitors do not need to wear masks or be vaccinated or anything. They will be just like everybody else who comes in. Um, however, it doesn't mean that teachers have to have visitors in. Teachers may choose to, but they still have discretion over whether they want to have visitors in their room or not. But they will have, they'll be allowed to starting on the 28th. <laughs> we are shifting from the test and stay model to the at-home testing model. Uh, this is just some background. The state offers a number of testing options, um, and we have been participating in symptomatic testing. So if somebody has symptoms, they can go to the health office and get tested, obviously with parental consent and um, you know their support. And then we also have test and stay. And test and stay happens for individuals who are close contact with somebody in school. They come in here in this very area and they are tested. It usually takes about 15 or 20 minutes and then they head back to class. 
because one of the reasons why I tested to say work was because of the mask, because the mask limited the number of close contacts that we had in school. One of the definitions, one of the exceptions from being a participant in Texas Day was having a mask on. But without masks on, that opens the door for many more close contacts. And because of that, that will make, that will significantly increase the number of, of close contacts that we have, which will overwhelm the Christmas Day system. It will also increase the number of students who don't have permission to participate in Texas Day and who would have to quarantine at home. All of those things are, are detrimental to the learning environment. So we're going to shift from Texas Day to at-home testing. With at-home testing, people who participate, it's optional, don't have to participate. People who do, uh, students and staff members, will receive a kit with two tests every other week. And we'll send them home on, when, on, excuse me, on Tuesdays. And then on Wednesday, everybody who participates agrees to test, symptomatic or not. If you are negative, then you come into school and have a great day. And if you are positive, then you stay home from school and you call the nurse and the nurse will tell you what to do. And through testing, through the at-home testing program, we're hoping to catch any asymptomatic cases or symptomatic cases and keep COVID out of the building. For, for at-home testing, people have to opt in. It's not something that we just give out. So I sent out a opt-in form today for staff members. We put a opt-in form for families on the website. I'll include something in my update tomorrow with information on that. And I'm hopeful that we'll have the at-home testing program up and running on the 28th. If it won't be the 28th, then it'll be the next uh, iteration and we'll continue to test this day until we have the uh, at-home testing ready to go. And then the last thing is for communicating, I'll still continue to communicate out positive cases, but since we're not gonna have close contacts, we won't be contact tracing anymore. I won't be able to say that anyone's been identified as a close contact. I'll just say that we've had a case and um, we'll, we'll notify people of the positive and we'll encourage them to monitor for symptoms and participate in at-home testing so that we can catch any cases that are out there. If a student Test, po test positive at home, mm -hmm. just to make a, an example. Sure. Okay, so the student tests positive at home, and the, so it's the parent's responsibility to call the school and, and let the nurse know. Correct. And then either the nurse or, or a principal or somebody will send that, the email out to the parents of, of the yep. students in the same class? It'll be the okay. same protocol we follow now, okay. just it'll be the language we tweak because we won't have anything about Testing about to, close test yeah. day or close contacts. Right. Okay. So it'll be a it'll be an email to the class sent by the principal mm -hmm. and email to everybody from me. Okay. We'll see how that works out. We may have to adjust on that depending on how this is uncharted territory for us. So this is the intention. This is how we're going to start things off with the communicating part, but we may adjust depending on yep. on how things go. And this is aligning with KP. Exactly. You yes, you took me. I was just going to say <laughs> we, we, we reached out to KP to make sure we align with them so that we have our time frame the same. So the parents, the students in both districts, don't need to worry about opposite weeks, different days, yeah. or yeah, opposite weeks. Smart, or whatever. smart. And Norfolk and Plainville Elementary. It's important. Uh, Norfolk, uh, not Plainville. Plainville's on a, they're on a Tuesday, Thursday schedule. Oh, I'm sorry. No, but they're at least also signing up for at home, and they're no longer doing test this day. Yes, That's what yes, I'm they are. Yeah. yeah. But they're not, yeah, their their days are long. Yeah. Like, I, I just have one question. Um, in how we communicate with the families when the email goes out telling them about the visitors, mm -hmm. right now it, it's worded in a way that visitors are not required to wear a mask but are encouraged to if they are not vaccinated. Mm -hmm. Could we change that to visitors are not required to wear a mask but encouraged but are encouraged to yes. and skip the anything about vaccination? Mm -hmm. Because sure. I would like Love anybody it. who is vaccinated who would like to make, wear a mask doesn't suddenly, I just, it's, I like it's it. weird. That's a good <laughs> yeah. Thank okay. You. Thanks. Yeah. I'm happy to answer any other questions that anyone has about any of this stuff. So, what's our schedule for the at home test? Well, like, so. The timeline is I had to wait until your, your vote went through yep. 
Um, so today I applied to the state and the state, uh, which so I should hear from them probably tomorrow. And the next cycle for test distribution, because they distribute the tests every other week, would be for the week of the 28th, which means they would UPS the tests to us next week. So we would have them ready to distribute for the that that Tuesday <laughs> prior to um, I guess that's the first. And those who opt in will receive enough tests supposedly for each student in the household. Yes. So, so okay. yeah. So what will happen is the, uh, the on the form. Parents would need to fill it out for each child so that we know which child, which children have permission. And then the CIC team who works for, works with us now um, is great. Patrick Ross is our CIC nurse, he's wonderful. He will help us to get the tests, organize them, get them to the appropriate classroom and the tests go home with the students and they're back tests. And then the tests happen on that Wednesday. And people, actually that reminds me of a good point too. People can sign up, it's a rolling admission. It's not, you know, one shot and that's it. People may sign up um, at any time and people may, if they decide this isn't a good fit, then they can call the nurse and un unenroll, opt out, I guess, also at any time. Okay. What if, um, what if a family has a student or a child that's young, not, not in the preschool program or in, in the district yet, can they get a kit? For an, an underage child? Not, not through this program. Okay, no. it's only for the students. Mm -hmm. Yep. Good? Yeah, Thank so you. exciting. A lot of great changes happening. Um, let's just hope that we can keep, you know, we, I'm very thankful that we've had, you know, we had a huge surge in January. And um, last night, you know, I just, when I was reviewing the numbers prior to the meeting in case the Board of Health asked, but we had, you know, 200 cases in January, and um, it was remarkable how overworked the staff, everybody was. People were really running around, filling in different places and working so hard. I don't know how our nurses made it. Um, you know, they, they were just amazing. And I'm, I'm very thankful that, you know, infections have come down, and now we're in a place where we can make this reset safely move us closer to a more normal experience while still minimizing the chance of infection. So I'm really happy about all that. Agreed. Okay. So we're going on to, oh, it's your, it's your reporting now. Yes, oh, yeah. All you. Yes, still me, still me, still me, yes. This is a big meeting, thank you. Okay, um, so I have for you tonight, I have the, your, the, FY23 school committee budget proposal. So what we're gonna to do tonight is I'm going to take you through the first draft of, well, this isn't the first draft. This is the semi-final draft of the school committee budget for next year. And I'll take you through how we built it, what we have, and answer any questions you might. It's FY2022. Okay, but the, what, well, let me let me let me get rolling first and we answer some of these questions. Okay. Okay. So let's go through. Let me take you through the agenda here. So we're going to talk a little bit about what a budget is, um, how it connects with our vision, mission, and strategic objectives. I'll talk about the budget timeline and process, our priorities and assumptions that we're using to make the budget. Then we'll go through the budget proposal breakdown and analysis. Talk about categories and then the overall budget proposal and then we've got some of our grants in uh, the appendices that you can take a look at so what's the budget really what the budget is is the plan for how the district spends our money each school year um, the way it's broken down in Massachusetts is into these categories administration instruction student support services operations and management and programs with other districts but really what a budget's about are the people on the, on the right hand, on the left hand side there, excuse me, the children. It is about the students. We are here for them and the budget is here to support them in their learning. So throughout the whole budget process, that's what we keep as a priority is what is best for our students. We do that by having a district vision and a district mission. The vision is what our idealized version of the school district would be. And some of the key words in there are highlighted 
Our vision is we want to educate the whole child to ensure academic success, individual and talent and, and skills of our students are optimized, and then they become reflective lifelong learners. And we do that through our mission. We work with families in the community, establish safe, supportive, structured learning environments, where we provide multifaceted learning experiences through highly effective, consistent teaching practices and curriculum. We make all that happen through our three strategic objectives. These are the things that guide our annual goals. Sustain a culture of continuous growth and learning that fosters excellence and equity. By equity, we mean we want to provide each student with what that student needs to be successful. Not everyone needs the same thing. Some people need extra support. Some people need a little extension. We want to make sure we're reaching all the needs of all of our students. Excellence, we want to make sure that wherever their needs are, they have an excellent experience in the district. We feel passionately that we need to have strong connections with families in our community. It's always great to see selectmen vote cash here, and we've had a great turnout from parents recently, which has been wonderful. It's great to have the community involved in the district. We want to actively try to maintain that. And then ensure the schools are safe, innovative, and inclusive. We want everyone to feel welcome here. We recognize we have a wide range of temperaments, talents, and convictions in our district, but everyone in Rensselaer Public Schools should feel like they are welcome here, belong here, and we care about them. We've made a lot of progress under our strategic objectives. Um, just over the years, we've made lots of changes in curriculum. We've implemented consistent, uh, reading, writing programs uh, with units of study and library letters. We have math programs, uh, bridges and illustrative math. We've worked very hard on inquiry-based learning approach. We've implemented a response to classroom or social competency development, expanded our full-day kindergarten offerings that I discussed earlier, implemented a standards-based report card. We've been able to increase staffing in a number of areas. We have an assistant superintendent for curriculum instruction and assessment, vice principal, We've done quite a bit of work on that uh, equity piece with providing support for students who need it. Literacy specialists, math specialists, mental health professionals, nurses, co-teachers, lots of opportunities to help meet our students where they are and help move them forward. Expanded art class back to a full year for all of our students. Expanded our professional development opportunities and continue to improve our instructional technology, which obviously is an important aspect of learning. We all learned that last year and we'll continue to make sure we make upgrades in that area. Under our objective two, connect with families, significantly increased how we communicate within the schools and with our families with updates and letters and memos. We have an active online presence, the website, Facebook, Twitter, and our app. We have a welcome wagon to greet new families when they come to the district and partner them with existing families so they feel included and welcome here. We try to have presentations for families and guardians frequently on topics of interest, like our Fun with Literacy Week that's coming up. Curriculum nights. Um, and again, we have a number of staff members we've been able to connect with here. We pursued and received state grants for two years this year and next year to pay for two key positions, Director of Wellness and Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. We collaborate with Google. Uh, Ray knows one of our collaborators very well uh, to help us with uh, some, some coding work. We've got wonderful resources in the Western PTO, which all of you at the table are familiar with. The community are their great partners for us, the preservation funds, sweat funds. Um, we reach out with surveys to the community. Police, they've been wonderful with us. Our SRO, the Officer Schwab, he's fantastic. Sergeant Morris is a great cruiser. I love him. They're all just uh, wonderful partners in our, in our uh, community. And we were able to provide free transportation. We had a bus fee to be able to remove the bus fee. So lots of great progress there. Objective three, making sure the buildings and grounds are safe, innovative, and inclusive. Uh, we have a facilities manager now who oversees all of this to make sure that it happens. We partner with the town on a director of facilities and capital projects who's working on some of our more major projects like this room we're sitting in right now, for example, and our school resource officer that we share with uh, King Philip High School. We're able to complete Thanks to the town, a MSBA, Massachusetts School Building Authority supported school roof replacement project at Delaney School, significantly extending the life of that building. We have two new playgrounds at Delaney and Roderick Schools, both funded through fundraising, not going to uh, the town to ask for that. We were able to put that together through the, the gusto of the community. 
many uh, dancers and lip syncers helped contribute to that, to those libraries, to those uh, projects. Again, thanks to the town, we've got a wonderful library and technology lab at Roderick School. And thanks to the town, we got secure entrances in all the schools. We've got uh, interior locking doors in all the classrooms. We've got a Raptor check-in system, Visiplex active intruder alert system, but to go buckets in the classroom in case of an emergency, uh, emission door locks. We drill on safety and emergency procedures. We have efficient climate controls, energy efficient lights, and we've made aesthetic improvements. So lots of great things have been done largely because of the creativity and hard work of, of the people who, who work in the district. Very lucky to have such great colleagues here. Our priorities for 23 build on those things. Um, we want to maintain level of services and class sizes, which means we want to keep what we have right now for our current programs and staffing in place. <coughs> we want to continue our routine and structural technology replacement, moving through things like Chromebooks and smart boards that reach the end of their life cycle, replace them so they are able to be used for students and continue to reduce and eventually eliminate our full day uh, kindergarten tuition with the goal of providing universal full day, three day kindergarten based on our current target. And we think we'll be able to make that happen by 25, 26 and we'll continue to reduce it between now and then. So these are the line items that I mentioned before by section. And I'll talk, I'll take you through each one. Uh, these give you what we were budgeted in 22, what is proposed for 23, the difference in the percent change. And this is all in your um, text, the line items all in your text. Um, and these are the overview numbers. So for this one, our overall increase that we're asking for is a 33.4% increase, which is a $166,624 increase. That is mostly because of an administrative change. We moved one position from the 2000 line into the 1000 line because of a title change. There wasn't any change in money in the salary being paid. It was just an administrative change by moving a person from a director position to an assistant superintendent position. That clerical change boosted the 1000 line, but it also decreased the 2000. So, but for that, this would be um, a much more uh, manage, a much more uh, lower percent change. Uh, the 2000 instruction, this is where most of our salaries are. Um, and this is really the, 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 where the bulk of our, of our um, money is spent. These are salaries for directors, principals, teachers, paras, and assist, admin assistants. As I mentioned before, we have a, uh, this percent change, it's a 3.8% total change we're requesting, uh, an additional $372,343. And that um, is mostly impacted by two things. Number one, it's reduced because we moved that one position from the 1,000, the, the 2,000 to the 1,000. And then we want to move two positions from the revolving account, the tuition revolving account, into the operating account. Those two positions will reduce kindergarten tuition for next year. So we're building in these two spots, which will result in a lower tuition for next year. The 3,000, this is student support services. Uh, so we're talking about salaries for nurses, our school resource officer, and we share the school resource officer with uh, King Cole High School. This is also transportation. For this one, uh, we have a reduction, um, excuse me, a 2.4% uh, increase, which is $28,155. Um, and this is mostly, um, this is just a, a, a pretty regular change, uh, a, a increase. This is a, just a increase in salary for the people who are in there, um, which is why we have that increase. But nothing really unusual for the 3,000. 4,000 operations and maintenance. Um, these are salaries for our facilities manager and our custodian. Uh, and this is also part of the salary for our direct, the director of capital projects and facilities that we share with the town. We are able to pay for a lot of our repairs through the capital projects fund through the town or through uh, our facilities use revolving fund. That's the account we have where we get money for renting out Gibbons gym, for example. Um, we use that money to uh, put in that account so we can fund some of our repairs on our own and not have to go to the town for assistance. 
Uh, we also use this category to pay for all of our IT stuff. And this is a increase of $33,529, 2.2%. Again, nothing really significant here, just an increase based on moving from one year to the next and the increased costs associated with that. The 9,000, this is programs in other districts. This is related to tuition we spend for students who we're not able to meet the needs of those students in the district because they might be so significant or so unique that we don't have the staff here to support them. We have to send those students to what's called the town of district placement, which is a specialized program for students. Um, this year, we have a reduction of 36.9%, uh, $43,842, uh, $43, because one of our out-of-district students is moving out of district, so we will no longer have to cover that cost. So we're able to um, reduce that. Some of this is also offset by circuit breaker reimbursement, which is uh, from the state. That's money the state sends to offset some special education costs. The challenge is circuit breaker always comes in the following year. So you have to pay it up front and they reimburse you later. And we don't know what that amount will be until September. So putting all that together, the proposed budget, which uh, maintains level services and class sizes, continues our current programming staffing, continues our instructional technology replacement cycle, and continues to reduce and eventually eliminate full day kindergarten. That budget comes in at a total proposed of $13,523,086, which is $556,809 more than uh, FY22, which is a 4.29% increase on the budget. I'll pause there in case you have any Oh, Phil has his calculator out, so I'm going to say uh, he's going to come up with the number. I should, I should also mention that this, tonight, you do not need to vote tonight. Tonight, I take your feedback, <laughs> I listen, I absorb, and then I go back for the following month with Shannon. We give some feedback. We take your feedback, we put it into the budget, and then we have the budget hearing on uh, March. Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm sort of afraid I'm afraid to jump in before Gray does. So I'll go ahead. Ask our questions. All right, you'll go ahead for me. I, I have a couple of line item questions and then a more global question. So Great. maybe we'll start with the line item. So um, there were a couple of sort of larger changes, like the services under the um, administration, um, which which would be helpful to get a little bit more feedback on. Um, it seems like something like, you know, like copier equipment acquisition, but there was a big, pretty big jump in 2021. And so like the actual expenditure was, you know, twice what we're budgeting for this year. So I just sort of like look at those types of things, like what, what's going on there. And then um, the one area that was um, the, the biggest question mark in my mind was a line item is under the outside uh, district program for special education, where historically it's been, you know, closer to 300, 250 to 300,000 a year. We had a reduction in, uh, in the 22 budgeted um, and we only have 75,000 uh, in the budget request. So is, uh, is that uh, aspirational thinking or is that based on, uh, you know? No, that's based on what we know is gonna happen. Okay. The, one of the challenges with budgeting for uh, 9,000 is you never know when somebody might move in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and when someone moves in with an IEP that has an out of district placement, that, that's suddenly a cost that we that we have to, to carry. Um, so that's why there's so much volatility in that particular uh, category. And then I think the broader question or comment that I think would be helpful, and maybe it's uh, asking for a you know a briefing from uh, from Mr. Sweet on the town finances, mm -hmm. is that you know I just got finished putting together the paperwork for the for my company. And my expenses went up a lot more than 4% in the last year, right? Inflation was around 7%. Median house price and rent them is up 14.6% over the last year. Um, so it would be helpful for me to understand how town finances are able to react to those types of pressures, right? Like obviously a private company, we can just raise our prices and pass those costs along. Towns, I would imagine, don't have very similar flexibility, but I think it would be helpful, perhaps, for this because, you know, I think it's important, right? Our 
the rent to public schools is the largest employer by far in the town. I mean, by it's not even close, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, thinking through those questions and sort of getting a good grasp on the revenue side of things and how revenues uh, to the town change in these sort of times when you have very high inflation and, ex ex you know, we're, we're having double digit growth year over year on median home income. I mean, we're up uh, over $625,000 now in 2021 for the median house price. Median sale price is over 800,000. And, you know, in 2000, 2011, when I bought my house, it was like in the low fours, right? So we've almost gone up by 50%. And I don't, I don't think our budgets have um, no. in 10 years. So it's just helpful to understand that would be very helpful for me to understand the revenue side, because obviously we're, there's a whole process to that as well. So that's my more global comment is just sort of thinking through those types of and getting a little more information on the revenues. Then the line items, I'm sure we can just sort of think through, you know, individually. Yeah, the, the line, you know, Shannon uh, Shepard prepares the budget based on current, con I got like the copier issue rate. I'm sure we probably had a new copier contract or something then. And she, she tracks on all of, all of those okay. data points. So specific things like that, she can, yeah. she, she's away uh, at the moment, but that's exactly what she can. But that is based, I guess the point is like, these numbers are based on actual projections at this point now. These yes. are not placeholder aspirational Correct. numbers. Okay. Correct. Thank you. That's it for me. <laughs> Ray? So, no, my, my other question from earlier was, I think just, it's a tiny detail, but the, the title, FY22, should be FY23. So that's yes. why I just got nervous for a second, thinking that maybe I had been looking at the wrong spreadsheet. No. That's all. <laughs> no, I think that's a typo. Yeah. Okay. But good catch. <laughs> So I just for a second there, but then I no, have another you. question. Well, that's an easy one. That one I, that one I like. Do you, want, do you want another one? Well, I would have been, I find it very interesting to be able to look at the grants that are expected to come in. And because you mentioned earlier that Wayman used some COVID grant money to cover some of the kindergarten costs. Mm -hmm. So I would be really interested to see what type of COVID money maybe we're expecting to have. And I know that some of these funds have to be spent like within two years or something. Yes. And it's kind of a one-time fee that's not part of the operating budget. Yes. Well, considering that kindergarten is hopefully going to go and be in the operating budget starting 2025. That's right. We might potentially be able to use some of the COVID money to cover some of it and help financial uh, assistance or who knows. So I would be very interested in looking into that. If only, that's why if only we had a slide that had... Uh, had that in there. Oh, fortunately we do. Oh. <laughs> so, there so, um, so, so good thinking, very, very prescient. We, we do have that. So I'll thank you for wait, some wait, of sorry. that. I just, I'm worried that the, there's a problem. Yeah. Uh, but we're still working out. This is a brand, you know, our new system. We're still working out the kinks. <laughs> Louder. But uh, there we go. I'm sure we'll get there. Thanks, Tim. You just want to make sure everybody stayed awake during right. the budget presentation. <laughs> Next one will be a drum. siren sound. <clears throat> That's right. So this just gives you a sense of where our past budget requests have been and um, how uh, and, and what the town has uh, provided through town meeting. Um, and you'll see that uh, the town the town has partnered with us well. They've, they've typically come in a little bit less than we ask, but we've been able to continue our operations. So they've been, um, they've been good partners for us. Uh, <laughs> So 4.29, that's a little bit higher than, than you see we've received, but um, you know, we'll see where we, where we come in. And as Phil had mentioned, a lot of the things in here, there's, we feel comfortable with a lot of them, but some of them are, are still anticipated costs. So it's still always a little bit nebulous at this point, but as things get firmed up, we find out more information from the town, we'll be able to really get things finalized for you um, as we get through the spring and into the summer. This gives you a sense of the most recent data on per pupil expenditure, just comparing us with KP, Plandall, uh, North Fork, and state average. Uh, and we've been up and down in this chart uh, over the years. Uh, I'm glad that we've moved up. We were in the bottom for a couple, my first couple of years, but we've moved up, which is great. Um, and this is for uh, comparing <laughs> FY20 and 19, which is the most uh, current data points for uh, available on DESE. We see we're right there, right above the state average and uh, below KP and Plainville, but above Norfolk. 
And here's where uh, our, some of our grants go. These are our federal ones. You can see uh, the amount that we've received in the past, uh, up to 22, and how we've spent that money. Um, so you get a sense of the staffing we provided. A lot of this is support for um, you know, providing support, additional support for students. We've got our staff development there. A lot of the federal grants are pretty prescriptive in what we can spend the money on. So <coughs> these are uh, the areas that we use them for. And I should point out this will all be, um, this slideshow will be posted on the website and um, so you can review it at your leisure, um, <laughs> as can anybody, uh, once you get to tonight. And then the next slide, Oh, look at that. Look at that, Grace. There you go. Some of the things you're asking about. So we are currently using um, our money to, uh, the money we've received from the, from the federal government to support some staffing positions primarily around uh, academic support for students. We put, prioritize that because of the fear of learning loss due to COVID. And we wanted to make sure that we could, as I mentioned at the top, we wanted to provide positive experience for all our students. We want to meet them where they are and help them move forward. And so we were able to use some of this money to add some of those curriculum support positions. Our hope would be to be able to continue those as we move on. We, ought, we will be able to for, for next year. Um, many districts have spent all of their money so far. We have not. We need to be able to save some so we have another year of support for those positions. But we'll, um, after that, we'll see if we're able to maintain the positions or not. I hope we will, but we'll have to kind of see how that budget turns out at that time. But Vanessa, you do a lot of work with the grants. Do you want to mention anything that I might have missed about any of them? And if you'll note from my note at the bottom, this is my last slide in the presentation. <laughs> a good reminder. Yes. Is, is that the total? Do, do we expect to get any more COVID funds after this? Is this the no. total amount? This is the total amount. I would really be interested to hear how Layman did it. Well, I mean, I do, uh, uh, what I do know about it is that the uh, that the COVID bill, the large COVID bill that went through the state legislature in 2020, um, that the the state senator was able to include an earmark in the Senate bill for this purpose in the bill. And so um, I did uh, reach out to uh, Re Representative Dooley about this. I also have a, a meeting scheduled with um, Senator Rausch to talk about what opportunities there might be in future legislation for similar uh, grants. And, um, you know, both of them were very responsive and understood the, the need. Um, and, you know, of course, uh, there is, um, there's a lot that goes into, into that kind of thing. And, and those, those COVID relief funds, it was a large amount of money, a lot of which came from the federal government through the states and block grants. So I don't know that there will be an obvious opportunity like that coming forward um, now, but um, you know we're certainly going to going to look at it. But it was basically it was an earmark. It was basically they wrote it right in that that's how the money that was going to come through to the towns that for Weymouth that was what it was going to go towards. You know I, I will say that um, a lot of schools are having challenges now because. Um, when you look at these budgets, you look at sort of what do I need to do to meet the minimum requirements of what I have to do given the budget that I have. And anything that is discretionary is essentially on the chopping block if your revenues aren't there, right? So one sort of simple resolution to all of this, whether or not it's politically feasible, but for people who are very interested in this issue, Massachusetts could, as a number of other states do, require full day kindergarten for every district in Massachusetts. There are a number of states that do that. They just say, it's good for the kids. We think this is how it should be. Here's a little money to help you with the formula funding. Now go figure it out, right? Um, in which case, we would not have to have the conversation about revolving funds, GoFundMe accounts, uh, 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 relief grants, etc. It would just be, you got to do it, get it in your budget. 
Um, there are, I'm sure, reasons why people are opposed to that. So I'm not suggesting that that's you know it's fully thought out what we should do or anything. But for people who believe that to be the case, that is a definitely a, a way forward, which is just to require it the way many other states do. Um, in the interim, right? I think that you know, and there's very few, and, and every year there are fewer states. But may, I'm sorry, uh, uh, towns. But many of those towns are struggling because when you have a budget shortfall. It is very tempting to say, well, where else can we get some revenue? Or where else can we cut some money? And if you cut art, music, whatever, it creates all kinds of other issues. And you could say, well, I can upset one grade worth of people to collect money from them for that year. It is an easier sort of political solution, I guess you could call it, small p solution to solving a budget shortfall. And so some towns that have offered free full day kindergarten have actually backslid for a year or two here and there. So it is not always a permanent solution because many towns are tempted to dip into a tuition um, because they can. They're not required to offer it. Yeah. So but that's definitely not something we're considering. Well, no, but we are still charging tuition, right? So I, I think the way to make something a permanent change is through legislation at the state level that would say it's every town has to offer free full day kindergarten. Then it's then it just is. Okay. That would increase the formula funding somehow. I mean, but. that's how in the first place the other towns were able to offer free kindergarten. It was earmarked in the budget by the state. Right when we missed out on that opportunity, they, but yeah, they, they allowed district to participate in the kindergarten grant through the state. Yes, but so that's your mission is to be able to earmark that for run from. Yeah, I would very much like to see state funding help solve this issue as opposed to asking parents to pay it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're meeting with Julie for Crouch. What about Baker? <laughs> well. I, I don't know, you know, I, I think this is going to be a longer term legislative play and he's not running for re-election, so um, There's a guy in I don't have a call, <laughs> yeah, I don't have, I don't have the governor's speed dial, you know, but uh, <laughs> you uh, I do think, I, I mean, I, I do think it's, 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 a lot of people have actually, since, since we, since I put out the um, GoFundMe, a lot of people have asked questions about this issue and I've said to them, you know, the permanent solution is that the state puts in the extra formula funding and requires full day kindergarten. Would and, that put us in a pickle? Well, we would we would get additional formula funding, right? We would get an increase in funding. Yeah, it would need to be the problem would be yes, we would. We would they give a different amount for half day kindergarten, full day kindergarten through through ten uh, percent of any funding. But um, what would the problem is that you get the money a year later. So they would need to bridge that gap. If they put the mandate in place, they would need to put front load that money so that we would have the money to pay the salaries immediately instead of waiting a year to get the money because we'd be we'd have a five hundred thousand so, dollar gap for that one that one year. I do agree on the idea of this needs to be a quick fix more than I mean for other towns who maybe don't have the solution that you and um, uh, Shannon have been able to work into the budget in order for twenty twenty five to happen. I understand that that's a solution maybe for other towns, but Runtham needs, if we if we get a quicker solution for the next two years. So I understand now a little bit better. The well, we're going to keep chopping away at it, and I I've got a good. If we can move those two positions into the from the revolving account into the operating budget, then tuition will be lower next year. I mean, it's going to be lower next year, and you know again we still have the financial scale, and now if we're able to get this additional money to help people who still need help. It's definitely moving in the right direction. And I'm, and I'm really, I mean, I'm very thankful that we've been able to get as far as we have. And when I was looking, I asked Shannon for the numbers on where we were with tuition and where we are. It's, I was really happy. I'm like, this is, we're making some legitimate progress on yeah. this. This is really good. Yeah. yeah. And being able to set the target date, I mean, that was a dream. I mean, we never, we wouldn't even, yeah. it just yeah. was not a reach before. We didn't, couldn't even conceptualize what that would be. Yeah. And now we're, it's tangible. It's going to happen. Right. It's awesome. I mean, it's it great. is. So yeah, I'm sorry to not like, but it is what tonight's about. But um, I would I would work with West too. I would um, 
I know that you talking with PTO, yeah. but since West covers educational grants that aren't covered by the uh, operating budget, there should potentially be a solution if there's ever a need of family that needs help. Yeah. And maybe whether it's the principals or a representative like the teacher union or some group that goes to West to say we need these emergency funds, mm -hmm. which I know that West has opened up to emergency grants, like not the one year process, mm -hmm. then why not do that? It's to cover an educational need that is not covered by the operating budget. Yeah. That has been a thought. Yeah. yeah, that has been a thought so far. Awesome. Just a thought. Just so a thought. Far. So far. <laughs> Let's do it. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So as you think about the budget going forward, if you have any questions or suggestions, just shoot me an email. And okay. then on the 15th, we'll have the budget hearing. And that's what you were referring to earlier, Craig. We have an opportunity for people to come in and ask questions. And we have that kind of dialogue. And then after that's over, then if you still want to proceed, then you can vote to approve the budget at that meeting. Okay. Or you can give me more instructions, and we can have another meeting later in the month, and you can vote at it. Thank you. Thank you for the slideshow, too. Well, lucky for you, the slideshow continues. Oh, it's not the last slide. No, it's the last slide for my presentation. But next up, we've got Director, or excuse me, uh, Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum Instruction and Assessment, Dr. Vanessa Shane, to follow up on what you had asked Ray at the last meeting, a quick refresher on MTSS. So here we go. <laughs> All right, so uh, thank you for having a few minutes left over for the just-in-time learning and the multi-tiered system of support. Uh, so way back in September, I shared this slide on learning acceleration. And basically we were explaining that we're accelerating access to grade level learning, uh, not teaching faster or increasing the pace of instruction. And so we do that by providing just-in-time instruction of the critical content and skills. And actually you can skip to the next slide. We're going to show two examples. So if you think of the remediation model versus the acceleration model, um, the top uh, blocks there, the A, B, and C blocks, represents a full year of school learning. So let's just say um, if that is the grade four year. And now the student is in grade five, and so if you follow the school year at the bottom of the screen, what is happening in the remediation model is that you are reteaching a fair portion of the previous year's skills, going way back and teaching forward from that point, and then leaving a marginal time for the new content learning. As opposed to the acceleration example on the next slide. Oh, right. <laughs> so we have that the previous year represented on top. Now we are not going way back and building forward from that far point we are pulling in just what is necessary at the very start of the year from the previous year, and then providing access to the content uh, right away. And later on in the year, in November, December, you can see some content skills came from different parts of the previous year's instruction, and then that allows the students to access the current content of that grade. So uh, just-in-time learning is exactly what it sounds like. You're providing that immediate instruction, re quick review of the skills needed to access grade level content. Um, so any questions about the just-in-time portion? That's really, really we're, we're good? Okay. Well, no, I do have a couple of questions. Oh, you do? Uh, okay. But I, is there just-in-time right now happening in my head, so they maybe don't make <laughs> um, uh, But this is such a great visual. Uh -huh. Awesome. I guess. If, can you go back to the first slide? Sure. And I'm really just asking these questions because I really just want to understand it in case, like, just even personally, and I have the opportunity to ask these questions. <laughs> but so I, I thought that the just in time was mostly for any student that was maybe struggling. But this is actually really just for, for all students to, to benefit. Mm -hmm. That the case? Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Yes, I, I I will say it's not necessarily one or the other. There may be a student who is struggling with a particular um, content and requires some um, more targeted intervention in that way. 
Um, but I'll get to that in the multi-tiered system of support too. <laughs> okay, so then I'll let, uh, should I let you keep presenting and ask my questions at the end? Perhaps okay. we can, and we can I'll tackle that. all of that at the end. So um, the multi-tiered system of support or MTSS is uh, the acronym that a, a lot of people are using. Um, so it really just starts with this concentric uh, circle here where the outside is the universal design for learning. That too is what it sounds like. It, you are planning for all students. Uh, one of the tenets of MTSS is that all students are capable and that we can anticipate what some potential barriers may be. So um, an example of that is what we're doing right now. I'm showing a video on the screen, which for students who um, that is a learning strength, the visual um, realm, that provides that support to those students. And for students who are more auditory learners, my explanation at the same time can reach those students. So this is just one, you know, one example. Um, another barrier might be students who are learning English. Um, they may require some additional preview or pre-teaching. Um, so if I'm teaching the water cycle, for example, I'll need to pre-teach the vocabulary to students learning English so they know what condensation, precipitation, accumulation, and evaporation are. Otherwise, the content that is being shared will not have that strong meaning. So those are examples of barriers that we can anticipate. So by proactively and preventatively planning lessons and units, we are able to address those in advance and providing greater access to the learning for all students in the classroom. So that's universal design for learning. That's where it all begins. That's that tier one strong classroom instruction for every student. Then in the middle of that circle, we have that school building and it's showing tiered support. And you, can, you probably can't see from here, but they have arrows going in both directions. And that's to symbolize that this is a fluid model. So the idea is that students may require some targeted support at that tier two level for specific content and skills. This would be a short-term intervention. We provide those skills and, um, and strategies that the students need to access the grade level content in, in the classroom, for classroom instruction, excuse me. And that can be social emotional, it could be academic support, it could be behavioral support. Now, some students may require more intensive intervention. And so that might look like a different approach to teaching strategies for reading comprehension, for example, that through a systemized um, progression of teaching, that student can develop those strategies and then also apply and uh, gain greater access. So that multi-tiered system of support really just means it's a fluid model of, of instructional practices and based on students' needs, we provide them with the support that they need. We do we monitor this throughout the year. It's a school-wide effort. And um, as we track student progress, we're able to either release from an intervention when the students have gained those skills, or we may be providing additional supports or a different support based on what the data tells us. So um, that is basically uh, what MTSS is all about, but I am happy to answer any questions. Does that help a little bit? Anybody have questions? I'm okay. Go ahead. Thank you. You're all set? Really? <laughs> um, let me just organize my thoughts. How long does it take? I know you, you are identifying throughout the year yes. needs, but is it really, are you able to identify right away and put students in the program right away, or is there some sort of lag, like six months? or the following year? So it's ongoing. So we're tracking student progress throughout the year and using a variety of measures. So a classroom teacher, for example, may notice that a student is, um, is showing that they're having some challenges in, let's, let's say, reading comprehension for um, just as an example. Then the teacher may reach out to the literacy specialist too um, and reach out to, uh, in addition to the assessments, but reach out to the specialists. And there may be some additional classroom interventions that the classroom teacher can put in place 
as part of the core classroom instruction. So it is not a prescribed um, program with a prescribed timeline. What we do is we track how long do we think it will take for a student to gain this particular concept or skill um, so that they can access the content. And then we continue to track that progress in the intervention. Um, if the intervention is working and the, the progress is going, um, but they're maybe not there quite yet, we may continue that intervention. If it doesn't look like it's progressing the way that we think it should, we may revisit the data, look at what the current data shows us, and then provide a different intervention. So it is not so much a prescription as it is um, a fluid model to target what is the issue right now and then address that particular issue. So like every week you're constantly, like every day, you're constantly speaking with professionals that are dealing with or teachers that are working with students and you're reevaluating regularly and you're constantly moving. Well, it's, it's important that we give students time to learn. So it is, it is not something that um, there's a high rate of turnover. Um, we need to, anytime a student is learning a new skill, it's going to take time and um, you know, numbers of learning opportunities. So there's a, you know, there's a period of time from when something is beginning to be tracked and when it ends. Okay. And my last question is in that first slide where you have all the different colors. I'm sorry, I have a hard time. The, the first slide with all the different colors where it's not A, B, C, but it's kind of scattered. Right there on the screen, Gray. Yeah. Is that the same pattern for the entire class or is that where you show the tier one, tier two, tier three, where students might be suddenly, oh, we're pulling in A, we're pulling in C. Okay, so the letters may be confusing the issue. So if you think of a fourth grader working with fractions, before they tackle the fourth grade skill, they may need to dip back into the third grade fraction lesson um, and familiarize the students with that vocabulary again and the concepts so that we can add on the fourth grade content. And that's per class or per student that you would evaluate that you need to revisit that fraction? Oh, that's a good question. So there are different pre-assessments so that we can see what skills they we may need to reteach um, from the prior year. So there's classroom teachers will know what um, what they may need or, and, or can just make an educated guess as to what the class will need. Um, and then if other students seem to be, um, if there seems to be a gap in a different prerequisite skill, then that can happen too. So it, it is at a student level to some respect, but this is just giving you a glimpse of what it might look like in a classroom. Great, thank you. Sure. I really feel like I have a much better understanding. Thank it's you. wonderful that we have so many specialists available for general ed students. It's, it, it wasn't always that way. I can give you a concrete example. Yeah. Um, I have a third grade student and I did receive a phone call from her teacher, a few, or an email from her teacher asking for a phone call a few weeks ago. And we, we had a Google Meet and spoke specifically about a math skill they were doing in the class, in the third grade class at that time, and she, she's there but not quite there and was asking permission for her to be pulled into a small math group outside of the classroom for a little extra boost. Uh -huh. And it's temporary, um, it's helpful, it's wonderful that it's, it's something that's offered. Not all districts have it. It's really, we're very fortunate. Thanks. Sure. And that's thanks to leadership of the school committees in years past supporting those uh, budget priorities. So, so thank you. That was under strategic objective number one. You may remember we pulled through both positions. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Boshane. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you. So next up, and my last item is sad for me. Uh, happy for somebody in this room. <laughs> It is the announcement of the retirement of our Director of Student Services, Karen McNamara. Uh, Karen is retiring at the end of this year. She's been the Director of Student Services in Rentham since 2009. And it is not possible for me to overstate her impact on the district. Um, she has been, she's rebuilt the special education program here with a student first approach. 
Um, she has built programs in the district so, so that we were able to keep students in the district rather than send them to out of district placements, which is better financially, as you we just discussed in the budget, but also better for the students to keep them in here in their community with their with their uh, peers. She's expanded our co-teaching model. She's expanded the mental health supports at the schools. Uh, she's brought in related service providers for students. She developed the district's uh, accommodation plan or our DCAP and updated it. She's worked on the handbook. She's really been involved in pretty much everything. Uh, she's a tireless worker, a ceaseless advocate for students and a really wonderful colleague. And I'm gonna be um, very sad to see her go and we are going to feel her loss when she's gone. So first I wanted to say that, and I, if it's okay with you, Madam Chair. I would like to have her. package is a timeline for trying to find somebody to fill uh, Karen's shoes so and, and one quick <laughs> funny note about Karen Karen's an amazing cook and in fact she gave me her super secret recipe for um, her her, her uh, pasta sauce or I, you know, gravy I believe she calls it and um, my youngest son his favorite food is uh, ziti with pasta sauce and so for his birthday uh, my wife made that for it and uh, he told me afterwards he said this isn't as good as yours and I'm like thank you and it's all because I made Karen's. Yes. So thank you. I told my wife, like, I guess I can make a better sauce than you. What can I tell you? So it's very good. Karen, thank you so much for all your service. Um, many, many years of dedication. We're very fortunate to have had you all this time. And wish you all the best in what's to come, the next chapter. Yes. And we'll see you on the sub list in the fall of next year, right? <laughs> Good. Uh, okay, so you're all squared. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, moving on to committee reports, and we'll start with Gray for the KP yes. update. Uh, so, KP, we went through the whole budget. So I'm not going to go over that with you. A uh, couple of interesting numbers for just uh, students who signed up for the at-home testing. 209 at the middle school and 197 at the high school. Mm -hmm. I thought that was interesting. And then I was just going through different points that I could share with you. One was uh, DECA has been extremely successful this year. And I think that they deserve a shout out. Uh, they qualified the most written projects in our region due to our members' leadership, positive energy, and ability to overcome obstacles. So we really need to celebrate that group of young students and their leader. Um, sorry about that. That's great. Oh, yeah. Wait, do they have a, like a competition coming up soon now? It's coming up soon, right? I, I guess. They yeah, do. they do. Because they qualified for the most written project. <laughs> I don't actually really know all the details about the program. I, I had a student reach out in the DECA program to see if she could practice her presentation during February vacation. So they are really oh, that's dedicated. Neat. It's pretty that's, exciting. That's well, Mr. Dow, James Dow, Rentham Parent, runs it. And every year he recruits people to celebrity VIPs to participate in their initial round. And they dig pretty low in the barrel because I'm one of the VIPs. <laughs> right. I know school committee members are always welcome. So. If you're interested, you can let me know. We get, like the, we get like the side sessions before they go in front of the VIPs. So. Yeah, listen, it's great. They're, they are really good. It's great. Yeah, yeah they are great. Uh, then there's another thing that I um, thought I'd share is uh, they're currently recruiting actors, singers at the high school to perform Legally Blonde musical. And I'm trying to get the, the dates. I think that the, the students are going to be trying out in February. So I'm hoping, yeah, let's see, February 3rd, the Legally Blonde musical. So I don't know when they're going to be performing. I don't know if you had a chance to go see uh, their performances. Before COVID shut everything down, I went to see the Charlie Brown one, which was fabulous. <laughs> so I really, really recommend that everybody go see their shows. Legally Blonde, 
years ago. I can't be bad. <laughs> Good to know. Thank you. That's all. All right. Thank you. Um, Aaron with PTO. Yep. Uh, we have one thing to report on. So on March 8th, we'll kick off our fundraiser for this year. And we're doing the WizFit Challenge um, with the Wizards. I don't know if you've heard of them. No. Um, they're a basketball team that they usually go around and perform, oh. kind of like the Harlem Globetrotters. Yep. But they are based, um, their program is based on fundraising. So it's going to be a virtual event, but we're going to live stream um, on the 8th. And then the next week, they'll do a gold ball giveaway. So that we'll live stream for that as well. So it'll be two to three weeks of fundraiser. Um, but we're really excited that the guys are a blast. I think the kids are going to love them. Um, so it should be a lot of fun. Is there going to be a game? No. Oh, we yeah. weren't sure when we yeah. planned it if we could have so people. So good. They're so great. Oh, yeah. my gosh. Caitlin and I have a blast just meeting with them online. So it should be a lot of What fun. did you say was the date for that? March 8th. Thank you. So information should be going home oh, next week. Great. Thank you. I was not at the meeting. Oh. The last meeting so you got to do the update. Oh, I was relying on you. Uh -oh. But you were there. <laughs> I was there and I, I can't remember what we up. talked about. <laughs> um, so let's see. We were, there was a grant. Oh, Katie could speak. Right. I know there was a grant. Would you want to speak to it, Katie? That's right. That's right. That's right. And it was um, first grade? Kindergarten, I'm sorry. And then did we approve the other one? That yes, so, that, yeah. sort of. Oh, you are? Okay. Okay. The possible, there's a possible another, a second grant um, coming in, or there was a request anyway, it's for uh, third, fourth, and fifth graders for uh, Helen Keller presentation. Um, it's a performer who acts as Helen Keller and will, I believe, come, right, to the school. So the and, fourth and um, fifth graders missed the it. Fourth the fourth and right, the fourth and fifth graders never got to see this before. Um, and it's typically typically a third grade presentation. And so the grant request is for third, fourth, and fifth, uh, which be great. And we're gonna I, keep I our, assume is going to go through. We're going to keep both eyes in the bathing suit this year. Yeah, great. And uh, Ms. Maloney, I heard that there was an issue with the process of the online process for applying for the grants. Yeah, I think. There was a little bit of a glitch, um, but I think we're figuring that out. Yeah. Well, I completely. Yeah, I completely removed the form. I don't know why it's not going through, so I just put a button that says email. So it goes. Wonderful. Had it Great. gotten lost because of the website? It did. Yeah. And it got missed completely. I'm so sorry about that. Oh, geez. Okay. But that's okay because we figured it out, and so it's okay, and it's okay. And I believe that West is reviewing um, the grants and how they'll be handled in the future. You know, we just have a few more months to get through for the rest of the school year. We're looking at, you know, maybe four more meetings, and then um, I think we'll be restructuring a little bit with. Um, board members and as we do every year and so we'll revisit the grant um, process at that time okay yeah right and we briefly spoke about doing another Oktoberfest um, next fall so that was a big hit this year and we had a great attendance and a super turnout and I believe it was our best fundraiser we had to date it was um, so much fun. It was, it, it was a great time. So we're talking about doing a repeat and then um, fine-tuning it a little bit. There were some, you know, it was a little spread out. Um, we had the auction table that was rather far from um, the beverage table and the food table. And so trying to sort of work around that. It was complicated because there's, uh, at, the, at the Legion there, there's one area that's flat. So that can accommodate tables more e e easily. Um, so we'll play around with the setup a little bit next year, next fall. But yes, I believe, what did we say? Martin, you, you were there too. October 1st, I think we said? Potential date. So. Sounds about right. Yes. Yeah. And that was West. There we go. There Thank we you. go. Okay. Uh, would somebody like to make a motion to adjourn? Make a motion to adjourn. Second. 
All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And any abstention? Great, thank you. Thank you for attending. Um, the next meeting of the school committee will be on Tuesday, March 15th, 2022. The agenda will be posted and public participation information will also be posted prior to the meeting. Thank you. Are they off?